what are the Big Ten's five most important football games this coming season? That's the question that I will be answering in today's video, but before we get to that, I want you to tell me in the comments down below what five Big Ten games you think will decide the conference's fate, whether the conference will have a successful year, whether they will win their first national title since 2014, whether they will have their worst season in several years, or whether it will be just like last year or the other years where the Big Ten has fielded playoff teams or a playoff team but has failed to win anything of significance. Last year was a phenomenal year for the Big Ten overall. Whenever you field two playoff teams, even if they don't win a playoff game, that's a success. The Big Ten's third best team, Penn State, was top seven to finish the year, finishing at seventh in the polls, and they won the Rose Bowl. But outside of Ohio State, Michigan, and Penn State, the rest of the conference was disappointing. And to a certain degree, even those three teams were disappointing. Michigan blowing it to TCU in the Fiesta Bowl, Ohio State similarly blowing it to Georgia, both had chances to win. Michigan never held a lead, but nearly came back many times and always failed to come up clutch. Ohio State blew a double-digit lead to Georgia painfully in the Peach Bowl, and Penn State, once again, for what seems like the nth year in a row, failed to win a big game against a great Ohio State team or a great Michigan team. Will any of this change this season? We don't know yet. We have to let Saturdays play themselves. However, I think these five games are going to be the most important when it comes to deciding the conference's fate. First and foremost, we have Iowa versus Wisconsin. And the records and the rankings that you see on your screen are my projected records heading into these games. So I think Iowa will enter this game with a 5-1 and one record, only losing to Penn State. Wisconsin will enter this matchup undefeated. I think Wisconsin is the 10th best team in the country in my preseason rankings, for now at least. And I think Iowa is the 19th best team in the country. So let's talk about the home team first. Let's talk about the Wisconsin Badgers. So the Wisconsin Badgers, they return Braylon Allen and Ches Malusi, who are phenomenal running backs. Braylon Allen has been an all-Big Ten caliber running back for two years in a row, breaking out as a freshman in 2021, and in 2022, having once again a good year, even with a far inferior offensive line compared to his freshman season. Ches Malusi has been a solid backup option over the past two seasons, so Wisconsin, they have a strong run game. And even though they're moving away from that style of football in favor of Phil Longo's air raid, they brought in quarterback Tanner Mordecai. Their offensive line, I think, will be loaded at tackle and will be solid on the interior as well. At tackle, Joe Huber, Jack Nelson are, are the projected starters and should be the starters for the majority of the season, if not all the season. At guard, you have Tanner Bordellini and Michael Furtney, and at center, obviously Jake Renfro is coming in from Cincinnati. Wide receivers, an area with some questions, but Chimere DK and CJ Williams do have talent and explosiveness to them. The staff, I think, will be one of the best in America. Luke Fickle's a top 10 head coach. I think Mike Tressel is a top 10 defensive coordinator. We'll see if Phil Longo's a top 10 offensive coordinator but he's certainly a top 25 offensive coordinator. And Luke Fickle also brought his strength and conditioning staff from Cincinnati to Wisconsin as well, which is going to be huge because Wisconsin needs some of that physicality back that they just didn't have last year in Paul Christ's final season. Defensively, this team at linebacker should be loaded. They have some questions at corner, some questions up front, whether it's D-tackle, or D end, but they do return Isaiah Mullins, who had a great 2021 year, but I think was sidelined with injury for a lot of 2022 or didn't see much action. They also have Kamoy Latu at secondary as well. So the Wisconsin Badgers, I look at them. I think this team will be top 10. They have home field advantage. Iowa, and more specifically, Cooper DeJean humiliated them at Kinnick Stadium last year with special teams, pick sixes. They once again made Graham Mertz's life just absolutely miserable, like any defense with a pulse will, which is why Florida will not succeed 
if they had Grayson McCall or Devin Leary or Malik Murphy from Texas, who I think is better than who will start there in Quinn Ewers, Florida might be a top 25 team. But quarterback is so important, and that's part of the reason I really like Wisconsin this season, and I think that they could be this year what TCU was last year. Is Tanner Mordecai a world beater at quarterback? No. But he looks like a Heisman candidate compared to Graham Mertz. And that, with a loaded offensive line, and Wisconsin being top four in the Big Ten in returning production, is going to create wonders. Let's talk about the Iowa Hawkeyes now. Iowa, last year they went 8-5. and five. Although, despite going 8-5, and five, I would consider their season among the likes of Michigan State, Rutgers, Indiana, Northwestern, Wisconsin, just programs, Nebraska, let's not forget my brutal Nebraska prediction that fell apart, the teams that completely fell off the rails. I know Iowa went 8-5, and five. however, with the amount of defensive talent they had, elite special teams, and a great tight end room, and they also had promising talent at wide receiver, and the offensive line, while bad, it was young, all of that was thrown away by he who shall not be named. Thou who cannot coach and cannot game plan for an offense if his life depended on it. He returns, and Iowa fans probably don't like that one bit. However, to Kirk Ferentz's credit, Iowa's used the transfer portal. They're bringing in Cade McNamara at quarterback. Their offensive line was very young last year. Almost all their starters, if not all of their starters, I believe, on the O-line will be returning this season. Mason Richmond is a good tackle, and their center interior offensive line should be solid as well, especially with Logan Jones. More importantly than that will be tight end. Luke Lachey and Eric All. Lachey is one of the best receiving tight ends in the nation. Tall, big, he'll probably improve his blocking this season. And Eric All's coming off of injury, but he's still going to be a great player. Him and McNamara were awesome players at Michigan. They helped the Wolverines beat Ohio State, beat Penn State, and win the Big Ten for the first time on Jim Harbaugh's tenure. Not beating Penn State, but doing all those three things in the same year. And the Penn State game was really the game where, in retrospect, that's when it was obvious that that Michigan team was was different. And it was full of difference makers. And Cade McNamara is a difference maker in the sense that he's consistent. His ceiling is not very high, but his floor is ex- his floor is high. He won't turn the ball over often. He doesn't make mistakes. You give him a great system, he will win you games. So Iowa, in my opinion, is getting a gamer of a game manager in Cade McNamara. And they also have a great running back in Caleb Johnson, who I think should rush for 1,000 yards this season behind a better offensive line. Obviously, Xavier Nwanka, Cooper DeGene at secondary. I don't even need to explain further. Very talented players. Linebacker Nick Jackson's coming in from Virginia. And... At the defensive end spot, Deontay Craig there, and you also have Joe Evans, whose name almost escaped me, had over 10 combined sacks. They should be one of the best defensive end pass rush duos in the country. Looking at this game, face value, it's in Wisconsin. They're going to be out for blood. Wisconsin's still recruited better. They've used the portal better. ESPN's FPI obviously favors them to win. They're given a 69.5% chance to win the game. I think this matchup will be what decides who wins the Big Ten West in its final year of existence. Wisconsin and Iowa, I think, are the two top programs right now in the Big Ten West. Minnesota's contending, and I actually think Minnesota will be better than Iowa this season. The problem is Minnesota faces both Ohio State and Michigan in the same season, and they still have to play Iowa, Wisconsin, and the rest of the slate, and Michigan State too. Minnesota's schedule, I think, is too tough for them to get to Indy unless they are a top-10 team, and I don't think they're a top-10 team. So this will be the game that decides the West, and I would go with Wisconsin here, winning either by anywhere from 7 points to double digits, I'd say. It won't be a blowout, but at the same time, I do think that Wisconsin is a better team decisively. 
Up next, we have Ohio State and the Wisconsin Badgers. This time, Wisconsin will still be at home, but this time it'll be a top 10 matchup. The Wisconsin Badgers, we've already previewed them overall, but I think that they have an edge over Ohio State on the offensive line because of tackle depth. And Ohio State, obviously they had to bring in Josh Simmons from San Diego State. They have Josh Fryer and some other key players at tackle, but all in all, looking at the tackle room, Wisconsin wins by a mile there. I will say, though, that Ohio State's guards and center, who will be Donovan Jackson, Jake, not Jacob James, but Donovan Jackson, and his name almost escapes me, I'm sorry, but the center will be Carson Hinsman. Matthew Jones, how could I forget him, rated very highly according to PFF. My bad. Donovan Jackson was a five-star out of high school. Matthew Jones will play opposite of him at guard, and Carson Hinsman at center. That will be one of the best interior O-lines in the nation. Wisconsin doesn't have those players on the interior, but they do have a much better tackle room. So overall, I would give the edge to Wisconsin at offensive line, but it's very close. And the theme that you can see here, and this is where we're going to preview Ohio State, is outside of the offensive line, it's not really close. Except for maybe linebacker, but when you have Tommy Eichenberg, Steel Chambers, and then C.J. Hicks can get some rotational playing time and wreak havoc if he wants to, well, even then that's not close. It really isn't. Maybe tight end, maybe running back, but even those areas, Ohio State's depth is just too great to be overcome. Too great. Their staff is better. Their strength and conditioning programs, I'd say, are similar to some of the best in the nation. But I think Day's a better head coach than Luke Fickle, mainly because he's just played in a tougher, you know, tougher part of the Division One FBS. He's played in the Power Five, coached, like played and coached in the Power Five, meant coached, not played. Luke Fickle's only coached in the Group of Five outside of that one interim year at Ohio State. I think that obviously Ohio State is the better offensive staff. Jim Knowles and Mike Tressel are both top ten defensive coordinators. Ohio State, whether it's Kyle McCord or Devin Brown, they're vastly superior to Tanner Mordecai. I do think Mayan Williams and Travion Henderson, when healthy, are both better than Braylon Allen. That might be a prediction that ages poorly, especially on the part of Henderson, because Henderson's great in, sp in speed, in space, but Braylon Allen is also great there, and Braylon Allen can also use a power ability and can just muscle through, just muscle through, like a bowling ball through bowling pins, which is something that Mayan Williams has, along with incredible speed and incredible vision. Wide receiver, we don't even need to talk about that. All Americans, Emeka Igbuka and Marvin Harrison Jr. will be starting for Ohio State, with Julian Fleming or Jaden Ballard, whoever starts at that third wide receiver spot, having the potential to be an all-Big Ten caliber wide receiver, or from an objective point of view, which the awards are not given from an objective point of view, maybe they too could be an all-American caliber wide receiver. Ohio State is going to be favored big time, big time in this matchup. And this matchup will be an opportunity for Ohio State to answer a lot of questions. And it'll also be a matchup that allows two top 10 teams, if Wisconsin wants to reach the college football playoff or have any hopes of being in that conversation and if they want to solidify their chances of winning the Big Ten West or perhaps the Big Ten this is the game to do it there's already a spread out for this game Ohio State's favored by nine and a half points per Caesar Sportsbook and I think that Ohio State this is a letdown spot they're coming in to to Camp Randall after facing off against Penn State the week prior. Penn State, I think, will be better than the Wisconsin Badgers. However, playing in the horseshoe versus playing on the road, it's one of those environments where I think there's a better chance that Ohio State loses to Wisconsin than they do to Penn State. And that's even, even with Penn State having a matchup advantage at defensive end versus Ohio State's tackles. But the Penn State game is a more important game than this for Ohio State and for the Big Ten, so obviously that's going to be in the next three games that we talk about. All in all, I think that 
Wisconsin's going to be out for revenge. Luke Fickle, there's going to be a chip on his shoulder. He's going to be coaching against the school that he played at, coached at as a defensive coordinator, and learned a life lesson from while coaching for them as the interim head coach. Ohio State won 2022's matchup in a blowout, 52-21. The game was never close. Ohio State scored 21 points in the first quarter. That was probably the game where, in hindsight, we could have seen that the Paul Crist era was done. And the Illinois game was sort of a formality of that and just gave Wisconsin the excuse and the ability to can him early, which helped them get Luke Fickle. Ohio State's given nearly a 90% chance to win this game, according to ESPN's FPI. I think this will be a game of passing, ironically enough. Both front sevens are strong, and both teams from a schematic standpoint. Wisconsin will have to see because Phil Longo's air raid isn't a traditional air raid. They like to run the football. But I imagine that both offensive coordinators are going to want to pass the football. Plus, both secondaries are weaker than their respective front sevens, in my opinion. Wisconsin has a great elite linebacker room, and while they're front four, or traditionally front four, but now front three, as they're running a 3-3-5, three, 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 I think that their back five, especially at corner, has some questions. Plus, Ohio State, with great quarterback play and elite wide receiver play, they're going to want to target that. And Wisconsin, very early, this will be a game where Ohio State's secondary can be tested. Their secondary had a lot of issues last year. Their secondary was the worst out of all college football playoff teams in defensive passing efficiency. With Jihad Carter and Davison Igbenosin coming in at safety and cornerback, respectively, along with Lathan Ransom, Josh Proctor, and Denzel Burke returning, it will be interesting to see how that defensive back unit pans out. I have to give the edge to Ohio State in regards to special teams. They return their punter, Jesse Murko. Wisconsin, along with Ohio State, traditionally hasn't been good at special teams, but Wisconsin's replacing more, and they were even worse than Ohio State last year in special teams, so I give the slight edge to Ohio State there. Tight end, Cade Stover is a weapon there, and last year, and not in 2021, but in 2022, there was never a tight end that really emerged from Wisconsin, whether it was Eschenbaugh or Cundiff or Rusi, and I think that will relatively remain the same this season. They might be more relevant because they'll have a better passer, but all in all, I have to give the edge to Ohio State there, and in most places on the field outside of offensive tackle or the offensive line as a whole if you want to grade it like that. I'd favor Ohio State to win this game, and while I think it will be close, controversially, I think this game will be closer than the Penn State game for Ohio State, I think that Ohio State will come out of this game on top. And Luke Fickle, if he wants to reach the college football playoff at Wisconsin and become one of the few coaches to reach the playoff with two different schools, this is his chance to do it because I think Wisconsin is going to be playing the Buckeyes close. Up next, we have Michigan and we have Penn State. What are your guys' thoughts on this matchup? Please comment your prediction and your opinions on this game down below, because here are mine. My opinion on this game is as follows. I think that it will be a critical matchup. It'll be top 10 for sure. I think that Michigan enters this game 9-0, partially because there's no opponent on their schedule before this game that will be of top 10 caliber. I think Michigan's the number one team in the country, as you guys already know. I think they'll go 15-0, and I think that they'll win the national championship, and that's why they're that number one team with that number one ranking by their name. I think Penn State will enter this game 8-1. While they can beat Ohio State, I think it's unlikely, and I'm not going to predict it. But they're a great team. They're a team that can win the Big Ten, that can reach the college football playoff, and I will say this boldly, can win the national championship. But the questions under James Franklin have rarely been can, it's will. Will Penn State win the Big Ten? Will they reach the college football playoff? Will they reach a national championship game and will they win it? 
Maybe at that point, it becomes a can they win the national championship question, but I think with the way they've been recruiting, they can. It's just unlikely. I also think it's very unlikely that they will win this game, or even keep it close. And it's mainly due to matchups. Penn State's only advantage in this game, and this opinion will be on my next Bold Predictions video, which if you want to see that Bold Predictions video part 2, along with a Bold Predictions video where I feature my subscribers' Bold Predictions, hit the notification bell, like this video, and subscribe so that you can get notified when I post those videos in the near future. But back to the topic. This will be on my next Bold Predictions video. Because a lot of people see this game and they think it's going to be close. They anticipate a defensive battle. Both teams like to run the football. Both, some would even say, play similar style of football. And there's some truth there. But let's dig deeper. Michigan is all about consistency. They're all about the interior trench play. They were not even top 70 in pass yards per game last season. They weren't. They would stubbornly run the football. Stubbornly, even with a talented wide receiver core, and even with a great quarterback and great tight end room, it stubbornly run the football, and they could do so. They had an elite interior O-line, and they also had an elite interior defensive line. Mozzie Smith was taken in the first round, and Chris Jenkins, the other starter at tackle, who's still with the program and is a part of a team that's top five in returning production, number five in returning production in the FBS, their top three when only looking at the power five, he's coming back, he's a great defensive tackle. Michigan loves interior trench play. They love trench play overall because their tackles are good, their defensive ends are good, whether it's Braden McGregor, Josiah Stewart, Derek Moore, Jalen Harrell, tackles, Ryan Hayes left for the NFL, but there's Carson Barnhart, there's Ladarius Henderson, will be starting there. And of course, there is always Trent A. Jones. Jones and Barnhart were, they shared playing time last year at tackle. Guard, Zach Zinner and Trevor Keegan return. Giovanni El Hadi is an amazing second piece on the depth chart option at guard as well. And at center, Michigan is Drake Nugent, but Raheem Anderson, he's also a good center and he's the backup. So Michigan is just deep in the trenches they're elite in the trenches at every position, especially on the interior. Penn State, they have the potential to be elite on the exterior of the trenches. You got Chop Robinson, Donnie Dennis Sutton, Adisa Isaac. Those are great players. And Chop Robinson, Adisa Isaac, that Danny Dennis Sutton, all those have the potential to be elite. Olu Fashanu at tackles already proven he's elite. He's gonna be a potentially day one pick in the NFL draft this coming draft, and Penn State's nice at tackle overall. Olufashanu is elite, and I think it's Caden Wallace is going to be opposite of him at tackle, I do believe. But if I'm wrong there completely, comment down below. But I'm pretty sure it's Caden Wallace will be the opposite at tackle. And he's a nice player. He's a good player. What about the interior of the offensive line or defensive line, though? And that's where the difference is, and it's a huge difference. Very big difference. Penn State traditionally has been more of a boom or bust offense already as it is. Whether it's the fact they've had better quarterback play and better wide receiver play and even better tight end play than Michigan has had when you compare the histories of James Franklin and Jim Harbaugh at their schools. But Michigan, even before the 2021 season, from my memory and looking at how Michigan liked to run the football and was successful at it, or good at it outside of the games against Ohio State, which were yearly beatdowns before 2021, always had better trench play, and even with typically inferior running backs, would have the better run game. So while there are some similarities in that they both like to run the football, Michigan is the much more physical team. And basically what I'm doing is I'm taking the long route, because I think that's the appropriate route to take, of saying that this game won't be close, Michigan will run for half a mile again, they'll probably hang 40 points. It may not be as drastic or as quick as last year, because the game's in Beaver Stadium. And Beaver Stadium is an intimidating place to play in, but Michigan won in Beaver Stadium 
in 2021. And a lot of those guys are going to be back. And Michigan, from a matchup perspective, I think owns plain and simple. They're better at quarterback. They're better at running back. They're better at wide receiver, tight end, O-line, defensive line, linebacker, defensive back, and special teams. Cornerback, offensive tackle, defensive end, maybe running back if Penn State's running backs stay perfectly healthy and Edwards has a year where he's even more injured than he was last season, maybe running back. Those are areas where they could be up for debate. Maybe linebacker too. There's a lot of areas where Penn State actually has the potential to say, hey, we're better than Michigan here. But I don't think any of those Penn State has an edge with in the preseason. I don't. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that I think Michigan is a even more vastly superior staff, whether it's Ben Herbert with strength and conditioning, Jesse Minner calling defensive plays, or Sharon Moore learning how to call and manage an offense, but certainly being one of the best of the best at developing on the offensive line. This game, for all of those reasons, I don't think is going to be, I don't think it's going to be close. I think that Michigan will run the ball. I think they'll pass the ball too, and it won't be the way they beat Penn State because Penn State is Kalen King, Johnny Dixon, Keaton Ellis. It's very risky, and you saw this in the Ohio State-Penn State game, it's very risky to try and only pass the ball effectively and beat the Nittany Lions because they have a great secondary. That's the strength of their defense is the pass defense. But if you have a matchup advantage against them on the interior of the trenches and you have elite running backs, it's game. And I think that while this game carries a lot of matchup importance, when you add matchup importance with entertainment value, this game would certainly fall down the list. Because I think after, whether it's a quarter, two quarters, or three quarters, Michigan will pull away and win by double digits. Nonetheless, ESPN's FPI, along with a lot of others, thinks this game will be closer than I do. Michigan blew out Penn State last year, so Penn State will definitely have revenge on their mind. And Beaver Stadium is a very intimidating environment. This will be Penn State's final shot, final shot to win the East, and Michigan's first top 10 game. First top 10 game. All in all, I think Michigan's the much better team, but Penn State's still a great team. In fact, I'd say a near elite team. I think college football is going to be deeper this year in the Big Ten and at the Power Five level. It'll be overall deeper than it was last season. This matchup is another matchup that, while I think will be on the, the it'll be high on the scale of importance, it will be lower when you factor in entertainment value. Now, Penn State roster-wise, matches up better with Ohio State than they do Michigan. And I think it's the same thing schematically because Ohio State likes to pass the football more and Penn State's better at defending the pass. The problem, of course, is this would be the perfect year, especially with Ohio State's vulnerability at tackle and Penn State being strong at defensive end. This would be the perfect year. It'd be the absolute perfect year for Penn State to beat Ohio State. I'm not kidding when I say that. Here's the problem. The game's in Columbus. Ironically, when C.J. Stroud leaves and when Ohio State's weak at tackle and Penn State's strong at defensive end, oh wait, the game's in Columbus, where James Franklin has never won. I know he's not won in a full big house either, but at least he won in the big house. Even though it was empty, at least he won there in the COVID year. He has never went on the road and beaten Ohio State. Or Michigan, if you only want to include their stadiums when they're full and had true home field advantage. And even with that mismatch, I look at quarterback, I think Kyle McCord or Devin Brown, just because they have a better quarterbacks coach and a head coach who's much better with offense than Ryan Day compared to James Franklin. And with Ohio State's wide receiver core and supporting cast, I absolutely think Kyle McCord or Devin Brown will be the superior player to Drew Aller. Absolutely. And boldly at running back, if running back can stay healthy, I think Mayan Williams and Travion Henderson are better than Nicholas Singleton and Katron Allen. I think they're better. Wide receiver, Ohio State is clearly above everyone in the conference. Michigan, Penn State, Michigan State, not close to Ohio State's eliteness at the wide receiver position. Defensive back, Penn State, 
they have a unicorn in Kalen King at defensive back. Ohio State might have that if they can develop Davis and Igbenosin, but I guarantee you that doesn't happen in a year. Maybe next year or the year after Davis and Igbenosin becomes what Ohio State used to have at corner, which was a first rounder, but I think Penn State has the edge at corner. They're pretty even at safety, so I'm going to give Penn State the edge at defensive backs. And tight end, I think Ohio State is the best overall tight end in Cade Stover, but Penn State has a deeper tight end room. This game, ESPN and others are more inclined to agree with me that this game may not be close. Ohio State is is favored by nearly 90% of a chance to win, according to the Football Power Index. Ohio State won 2022's matchup 44, 44 to 31. And this time, the game will take place in Columbus, as I've already said. Last year, Penn State, with a team that, let's be real, was inferior, at least from the point that they didn't have nearly as high of a ceiling as this year's team will, they led Ohio State in the fourth quarter. And they were able to limit Ohio State's ground game, partially because of running back health, but also the fact that Ohio State's run game and their offensive line, it's not built like Michigan's. It just isn't. And therefore, Penn State was able to force Ohio State to mainly pass. And when you try and be one-dimensional and pass against Penn State, it won't work. Because Terry Smith says, no, I'm going to unleash my deep room of NFL corners to torment you. And that's what happens. And the reason it fell apart was mainly because of J.T. Chuimolau. It was also because Penn State's not a good game day manager, and he does not instill the greatest winning culture at Penn State. I know that word gets thrown around a lot, but James Franklin's not a good game day manager, and his team and his players, they've gotten tougher, and I think this is going to be a really good Penn State team, but they're not, they're just not as tough as Ohio State or Michigan. But this is the chance for Penn State, and this is where I'm going to talk about what you may feel like is positive about Penn State for the first time. But I'm going to finish off on that because I think Penn State deserves to be positively talked about. This is the game where they can prove everything I say wrong. This is the game to do that. James Franklin's only beaten Ohio State once, and he's never beaten Ryan Day. In fact, he's never come within single, not not single digits, but within a possession, within a score of Ryan Day. He came within single digits with a nine-point loss in 2021. He's never come within less than two scores of Ryan Day. Not even that. He came within one score of Meyer in 2017, same in 18, and in 16, he straight up beat Meyer. And in 14 and 15, he played Meyer relatively close, 14 for the whole game, 15 for a few quarters, at least. This is the chance for James Franklin to prove everything that I'm saying wrong, to prove that his team has a lot of talent, to prove that he's learned his lessons and adapted as a head coach, like Jim Harbaugh has. Jim Harbaugh, for similar reasons and for rightful reasons, received much of the same criticism that I levy against Franklin, even by myself, before 2021. Because he had to prove himself. He had to prove himself. And James Franklin, while not on the hot seat like Harbaugh was entering 2021, there is pressure there to prove himself. There absolutely is. And this is the perfect game to do it. Penn State has a road game against Illinois and a home game against Iowa, which will be their whiteout game this season. There are games where Penn State, whether it's because of Franklin, whether it's because Illinois is a physical team under Brett Bielema, and if a running back like Josh McCray or another guy whose name I don't know is all of a sudden really good, and Illinois' great offensive line is able to manhandle Penn State's weak interior D-line, weak by Big Ten standards, it's good for Power 5 standards. Remember, the Big Ten or SEC is a different ball game from even the rest of the Power 5. There's a chance that Illinois can win, and there's even a chance that Iowa can win. But I think it's much more likely Penn State beats both of those teams, and probably handily, by anywhere from 7 to seven to 14, maybe 7 to 17, or even as high as 21, or maybe even more points if everything works out for Penn State. And I think the Nittany Lions, in fact, I predict that they'll beat Illinois by double digits. 
Iowa, I think, will be a closer game, but a game that where the score doesn't indicate the actual result of the game. I think Penn State will own that game probably by the fourth quarter, and they'll lock down Iowa. Those will be good wins, good testing grounds for Penn State, especially since I think Ohio State's defense will be elite. So they'll face an elite defense in Iowa, and Illinois has the potential to reload on defense, especially when you return Jerzon Newton. They return Jerzon Newton at defensive end, but we're not talking about Illinois. But I like talking about the whole Big Ten, so I'm excited for when I'm going to talk about even more Big Ten games. I'm going to make a video where I factor in matchups and like classic and entertainment value so like is the game going to be close what's the chance that there's an upset and there will be a lot more big 10 games in there so if you haven't already hit the notification bell please hit it now so you can get notified when i release that video too in the near future penn state if they win this game if they win the game against michigan it'll be a combination of home field advantage and they've proven me wrong if they win this game, it will be for more, I think, likely reasons because they have some matchup advantages over Ohio State. They'll be able to pressure Kyle McCord or Devin Brown all day. They'll force Ohio State to be one-dimensional in the pass, and it would be a close win. But a win nonetheless that James Franklin's never had on the road. This will be Penn State's chance to upset Michigan's and Ohio State's dominance. That will be Penn State's chance. To do those things and there's a good chance of that happening is it more likely than ohio state continuing the norm no but it's a good chance compared to years past and finally we have finally michigan and ohio state this will be a game that will be number one here and number one when factoring in entertainment and all-time classic value why do i say that michigan has dominated ohio state for the past two seasons well Michigan returns more in production. I think Michigan has the better staff. I think Michigan will overall have the better defense. Michigan may even have the better offense just because they're more secure on the offensive line. Maybe. However, when looking at the rosters, when looking at the fact that Ryan Day adapted once again in the preseason, along with Jim Knowles, when looking at the fact that Ohio State returned their entire wide receiver core, they returned linebackers, tight ends, they have an elite interior offensive line like Michigan does, and if healthy, their running back room could contest with Michigan's to be the best in the country, you know that this game, even if it's in Ann Arbor, even if it's in Ann Arbor, will be great. And I think it will be closer than the past two games have been. Michigan's my number one team, Ohio State's my number two team, and I think both will enter this matchup 11-0. With dominant wins over Penn State, with dominant wins over Maryland, both play Minnesota, who I think will be top 20, and they'll dominate Minnesota as well. Ohio State will win on the road versus Wisconsin. Michigan will win on the road against Nebraska. There's a lot to like about this matchup. Both will have strong strength of schedules and strong, even stronger strength of records. Ohio State, I also think, will win on the road at Notre Dame. Both of these teams will field top offenses, top defenses. Special teams is an area, as many of you have pointed out, especially Reginald Phillips, a loyal subscriber of mine. Special teams is a weakness for Ohio State, but I'm cautiously optimistic about their special teams this season. Michigan, once again, with Jay Harbaugh, will have elite special teams, bringing in kicker James Turner from Louisville who had a very good career there as place kicker, and they'll have Tommy Doman at punter. All in all, I look at, you know, Donovan Jackson, Matthew Jones at guard for OSU, Zach Zinner, Trevor Keegan for Michigan. Those two might be the two best guard rooms in the country, though Georgia would have something to say about that for sure, along with the likes of Oregon, Oregon State, Washington, maybe, maybe Kansas State with Cooper Beebe at guard. Defensive line, got guys like JT Tui Molau for Ohio State. For Michigan, I don't think they exactly have a unicorn at that position like Tui Molau, but they're deeper at defensive end. Defensive tackle, there's Mike Hall for Ohio State, Ty Leak Williams, Ty Hamilton. For Michigan, there's 
Chris Jenkins, Mason Graham, Kenneth Grant. Linebacker, obviously Tommy Eichenberg, who should be an All-American this season. Then for Michigan, they're bringing in Ernst Hausman from Nebraska, who is the fourth highest rated tr- player in the transfer portal, according to 24-7 Sports. And they return Junior Colson and Michael Barrett, who are all Big Ten caliber linebackers. And don't forget about Steel Chambers either for Ohio State. Don't forget about Steel Chambers. And then defensive backs, Michigan's much more proven there with Will Johnson, Makari Page, Rod Moore, Mike Sanders still, and they'll have Josh Wallace starting probably. But Ohio State brought in Jihad Carter, Davison Igbenosin, to fix up what was one of the more disappointing secondaries of the 2022 season. They lost Ronnie Hickman, but they returned Lathan Ransom, Josh Proctor, and both defenses will be loaded. This is a prediction that I have. I think both teams will have both top four defenses and top four offenses. And that's allowing some room for margin for error. If I wasn't going to allow margin for error and I want to make the prediction bolder, my true prediction is they'll have both top three in both. They'll have a top three defense, top three offense. Special teams, Michigan will probably be top 10. Ohio State will probably be, I think, top 30, top 25, top 20, which would be one of the better special teams units they've had in a while. But I think that's because between Xavier Johnson and Emeka Egbuka, they'll have a good kick return slash punt returner. They return punter Jesse Mirko, and I think whoever starts at kicker will be at least okay or above average for the Buckeyes. We don't even need to talk about wide receiver, really, or running back or these other positions, but I want to just because it's fun to talk about great players and great teams. Blake Corum, Donovan Edwards, Mayan Williams, Travian Henderson— all of whom have futures in the NFL. Wide receiver, obviously Marvin Harrison Jr., Emeka Egbuka, and I think even Julian Fleming have NFL futures, obviously. Cornelius Johnson and Roman Wilson could prove that they also have a future in the NFL, depending on how this season goes. Both have great staffs. I'd say Michigan is the better head coach, and they have the better defensive coordinator and the better strength and conditioning coach. I think Ohio State, just by virtue of Ryan Day, is calling, won't be calling the plays, but can call plays and can call great plays. And Brian Hartline is the best recruiter positionally in the country. I think he edges out Sharon Moore as an offensive coordinator, but it's pretty close. So I give staff to Michigan, tight end to Michigan, trenches to Michigan, but Ohio State has the better linebacker room, better quarterback room by a mile when it comes to depth. When it comes to starter, it's debatable. And by a mile, whether it's depth or individual player, they have the wide receiver room. Ohio State is nonetheless given a 71.4% chance to win this game, according to ESPN's FPI, which I think is asinine. And I think any Ohio State fan and Michigan fan would agree with me. That's asinine. Now, Ohio State's chance isn't zero. It isn't five. It isn't 10, 15, 20. It's probably more of like, a 55 or 60 or 65, maybe two-thirds chance that Michigan wins, in my opinion, just factoring in the home field advantage and the fact that I think Michigan overall is a better team. And from a schematic standpoint and roster standpoint, they match up with Ohio State well. Michigan is Ohio State's kryptonite. It's been that case for the past two seasons. Ohio State last year, if you change one play, they would have beaten Georgia and they would have crushed TCU. You would have had to change five or more plays for Ohio State to win against Michigan in their own house last season, and the same thing for 2021. So I'm very excited for this game. What I just said, I think that that will somewhat be rectified this season because I think this will be a very back-and-forth game. This will be a game that midway in the fourth quarter is still competitive, potentially even tied. I don't think Michigan will have as easy of a time pulling away this season as they have the past two, even though it's in Ann Arbor. I'm picking Michigan to win, but I think it'll be very competitive. It might be the most entertaining game of the year, along with the top-ranked game of the year, which would be awesome for the greatest rivalry in all of sports. That's all I have to say for this video. If you liked it, please hit that like button, hit the subscribe button, click the notification bell, and comment your thoughts on this video down below. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you guys around. Bye-bye.